So Amir asked me to do a little bath. Huh? Hey, we're getting oh, really? started. Sorry, should I? I probably I don't speak very loud. Um, yeah, Amir asked me to do a little bath uh, about ID map mounts, which is something that some of you might have heard about, um, probably over the last two years or so. Um, and I guess I first want to start with a little introduction, why we did this, so what is the motivation for this. Um, here's a couple of use cases. So first of all, uh, a non-container use case, because I always like to stress that it is not just purely a, a container feature, this is a generic VFS feature, um, is about uh, what uh, is called uh, portable home directories. So essentially the idea that the UIDs and GIDs that you put on disk, if you, for example, have a, um, a ButterFS sub-volume as your home directory or a USB stick or some external disk with XFS or an X4 file system on it, um, and you want to take this home directory between uh, two different machines, uh, and obviously you can have different login UIDs and GIDs assigned, but then you wouldn't be able to interact with all of the files on disk. So the only option to solve this problem in this case is you need to recursively chone all of these files, which gets even more problematic if you consider that uh, in your home directory, it's not, it's usually the case, but not necessarily the case that only UIDs and GIDs have been, files uh, with UIDs and GIDs have been written to disk that correspond to your user's UID and GID. There could be files that some daemon created with a specific UID and GID in there and so on. So if you recursively chone, you, you lose all of that information. It is a, issue that systemd, for example, frequently uh, ran into. And uh, the other case comes from, obviously, containers, because they're a really big, th they're a really big thing right now, or by now. Um, if you have a container that runs inside of the user namespace, then you will often have a UID and GID mapping in place uh, to ensure that UID 0 inside of the container doesn't mean UID 0 on the host. So if you break out, uh, it, you're not automatically escalating to root. And uh, that means the root of the, of the container usually mean, needs to correspond uh, to the uh, ID mapping used for the container, uh, which means that root, of fi root file systems need to be choned as well recursively. The big problem with this is obviously the, the larger your root FS gets or the more layers you have uh, that you use for an overlay FS mount and so on. Uh, the more expensive it act actively, uh, actively gets um, to, to chone them. Uh, the next thing is if you have something uh, where you want to give each container its uh, individual ID mapping, so it's separate user namespace with a different ID mapping, which is a use case that some people have, uh, then you also have the problem that you need to duplicate all of the storage. So each container, they can't share layers anymore if we're staying in Docker terminology, but each uh, root file system has to be copied into a, uh, into a separate directory. Um, so you, you're wasting a lot of memory and space for no particular reason other than that you want to change the uh, ownership of the files. And there's a, a bunch of other use cases on there where you, for example, want to share data between the container and the host. Let's say you want to have your home directory or uh, something that uh, recently uh, someone wrote a blog post about. They wanted to uh, build a minimal container where they use slash user on their host system inside of the container. That obviously won't be possible to do nicely because the ownership of all of the files on disk will not usually match the container's UID and uh, GID mapping. Um, there are some solutions to these problems already. There is a very limited number of file systems that allow you uh, to mount them inside of uh, containers. But the most interesting file system that exists in this area is OpenLayFS. Um, so you can mount an overlay FS file system inside of the container. Um, that doesn't necessarily help you because uh, the underlying layers that you use for uh, overlay FS will have their ownership changed anyway. So overlay FS is a stack and file system mounted on top of a bunch of lower layers. So if you share uh, 
layers, these layers can't be shared anymore if the containers use uh, different ID mappings. Um, and other file systems are rather uninteresting for, uh, uh, for data sharing or for using as rootfs. So you have tempfs, you have deftpts, you have sysfs, you have procfs, but neither x4, xfs, nor butterfs are actually amountable in this way. Another thing is that the file system-wide ID mappings do uh, what they say on the tin. They change ownership file system-wide. So if you, even if you were to be able to mount one of those file systems inside of user namespace, the uh, ownership changes would apply to, uh, uh, to the whole file system, which especially in the, if you think about containers um, as a bunch of mounts put together, um, which they usually do. Uh, you have a rootfs, and then you have a bunch of additional mounts in there, data sharing mounts, and so on. So a couple of bind mounts. Uh, and it's not necessarily always the case that all of these individual mounts are supposed to have the same ID mapping that is used. And so uh, a long-standing idea has, well, there are a couple of different solutions that you can take with this, but the most flexible a uh, solution that covered all of the use cases that people came to up with uh, us over the years. I took a long while to actually get to all of those people and talk to the different stakeholders. What they wanted was to make it possible to change ownership on a per mount basis instead of a file system wide basis. And uh, so it's a temporary and localized change in the sense that the ownership change is tied to the lifetime um, of the mount. And this is in, in a nutshell, from a high-level perspective, everything that ID map mounts are about. You change ownership on a mount-specific basis instead of a file system-wide uh, basis, which makes them very suitable for containers, for example. And uh, the API for this is based on the uh, mount set adder system call um, that's already fairly widely used. Um, which allows you to change mount attributes, various mount attributes, not just uh, the ID mapping that is used for a given mount, but also stuff like read-only, uh, read-write, and so on. Yes, Ted. Yeah, so when you say on a per-mount basis, that's mount, not bind-mount? Uh, that's uh, bind mount. Oh, on a yeah. bind mount. Sorry, I, uh, I should. Yeah. I, I forgot. I can use uh, uh, simple VFS terminology on a VFS mount basis. Okay, on a VFS mount. Great. Okay, thanks. Sorry. Um, and uh, so this is the API. This allows you to, uh, I don't know how many, have, uh, how many of you have seen this, this allows you to change mount attributes uh, recursively, which is something which the mount system call, the base mount system call, didn't allow you to do. You can mount, make mounts read only, node f, and so on. And this is the specific API that you need to use uh, if you want to create an ID map mount, which is to raise the specific flag and then pass the file descriptor of the user namespace in that you want to apply. Uh, to this mount. And this is, uh, this is uh, uh, basically the whole magic. Um, the VFS had to be taught to deal with this. Um, file systems don't need to be uh, really aware of it. There are APIs that abstract, abstract the necessary, the gory details away. Um, at least we try to make it so. Yeah. Is there a like a CL, is there like a command line helper program that makes this easy? Yeah, to use? so um, uh, this should be merged fairly soon. I can probably give a demo here. Um, let me try. And now let me significantly increase phone size. Can you can you all see this? So um, talked with Carol. Zach, the maintainer of util Linux, and because system D services um, already want to make use of ID map mounts directly for uh, isolated uh, services. And so they wanted to have this available in the mount tool. Uh, and so it is actually available, uh, should be available in the mount tool soon. Let me see if I have something mounted already. Yeah, I have. For this room, it's worth knowing that XFS test already has a binary that gives you this. Sorry? For this room, it may be useful to know there is already a binary in FS test. That oh, yeah, XFS test. I should probably say um, we have uh, a 15K test suite associated with our DMAT mounts that is upstream in, uh, in XFS test that uh, aims to cover uh, the behavior of ID map mounts under all possible combinations and tests VFS behavior, including ACLs, uh, 
capabilities, setting and getting, um, set GID inheritance, set DOID and set GID uh, execution, because this is all of where this stuff becomes um, relevant. Uh, and so file systems can just run XFS tests with that and they should have a clear idea whether or not they implement this uh, correctly. Every time we fix a bug or see a regression, we immediately add a test to XFS tests and that also has a binary to create ID map mounts. But for user space, it would obviously be nice if you could do something uh, like this. This is the command. So. Um, uh, mount has a set of options that are called x-mount, uh, and there is a bunch of complicated uh, stuff that you can do if people don't know, and it will gain a new mount option uh, called x-mount.idmap, and then you can specify ID maps or explicitly, so to explicitly say this is the ID mapping that I want to use, but if you wanted to, you could also say proc uh, some PID NS and then uh, the user namespace that you want uh, that you want to use. It's fairly flexible. The syntax is something like this. You can say, I want to map UID 65534, for example, to UID 1000, and then you can give it a range for how many UIDs and GIDs you want to map. I, here, I just want to illustrate, this is a shortcut for mapping both UIDs and GIDs. So, yeah. This means uh, map uh, 65534, which is the nobody, no group user, to UID 1000 uh, uh, in the uh, target mount. So if we look at source target, uh, source mount, um, then you can see there are two files in there, a directory and a file. Sorry that are owned by uh, nobody, um, no group within this mount. But since we created an ID map mount, I guess you can see here at target mount, if we look at this from target mount, uh, you will see browner browner is my UID, which is UID 1000, I can prove this. So in this mount, So this is very fascinating. So it sounded like you you mentioned there is a uh, a way to call out to a service or call out to a pseudo file for the mappings as well, right? Or to specify something because like typically these would be stored centrally. So the example I, I think of a lot is you know your NFS or your some right. file system, and uh, you have exactly that thing, right? Is it in your oh domain? you mean you want to call out to a service and say um, and use this ID mapping? Well, I mean to, let me give you an example. You have two containers running on the host. Yeah. Container one is a member of domain Pepsi. Okay. Pepsi does not have a user Bronner. Yeah. So you're mapping that. If that user showed up there, he's guest. Yeah. You already have that. Yeah. So, but if it's Microsoft, another container running on the same host, that container, yes, you do exist in your UID, you know, 1196 or whatever. So. The central storage of these, however you do it with SSSD or Windbind or whatever it is, or some future service, um, it makes sense that depending on who owns that container, is it Coke, is it Pepsi, is it Microsoft, um, those IDs could be mapped differently. They can, yeah. And so what I'm kind of wondering about is how you would call out to a service that know, knowing what namespace the container is, you know, is it Coke, is it Pepsi, is it Microsoft running it, um, would provide you the UID mapping for that, sort of like what SSSD or WinBind does today. I mean, that's a, that seems like a, I may be totally misunderstanding, but that seems like a user space problem. Look, if you buy, buy uh, if you essentially have infrastructure to call out, uh, give me the ID mapping that you want to use for this container, then you retrieve it and then you can set up the container with that ID mapping or the, for that specific mount and so on. I guess what I'm saying is that there's thousands of these entries they're stored centrally and then cached in these services like SSSD and WinBind. They cache other things too, but they cache group memberships and they cache all these things needed for actual evaluation. So these services already do all of that, but um, what they don't know is, is, you know, until you ask them, they, they're not gonna provide you the data unless you ask them, right? Because they're typically hooked into by PAM and NSS. You know, you're looking at logon, you're looking at, uh, you know, who am I, commands mm -hmm. like this. 
but the thing that's I'm a little bit confused about is is when you set up these these mounts like this, is there a way to automate it so the mount command can just go off and ask the user space service the right thing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's possible. That's what I meant. It's a user space problem. If you if you have a way of retrieving these uh, uh, mappings that you want to use and then translate them into a form that can be consumed by the mount binary, then this is doable. What I wanted to, um, in the last step, illustrate if um, the important thing, and this is the test, if I now create a file in there and say, and I look at it from here, then it will be owned by Browner Browner. If I look at it from um, source mount, then it will own, be owned by nobody, no group. So it's the, the ID mappings uh, essentially work in such a way that if you create a file on disk, if, you know, ID mapping, if an ID map mount says, map 65534 to UID or GID 1000, what that means is if I call stat from that ID map mount, I'm getting reported uh, 1,000 as the owning UID and GID for a file that is stored on disk as nobody, no group. So consequently, if you create a file or if you change ownership and say, I want this file to be owned by UID 1,000 or I want to create a file as UID 1,000, that means I'm putting a file to disk as nobody, no group, which conversely will be reported as being owned by UID, GID 1,000 through stat. This is an important thing uh, to note. And uh, this is uh, used already. So this is being, uh, so for people are more, a little more active in the con uh, container community, there is, uh, it's now part of the spec or it's becoming part of the uh, RunC spec. It's used in a C run, it's used in run C, container D has a pull request for this open or already support. System B and spawn supports it right from the right off the bat, uh, makes heavy use of it. Uh, system D home D uh, makes use of ID map mount. System D services will gain support for this. So there is a lot of uh, uh, activity going on around this. The file systems that uh, currently support this are um, X4, uh, XFS, uh, ButterFS, and uh, we have a patch series for OverlayFS that is scheduled, I guess, to be merged for. Um, what does the file system? Huh? What does the file system need to do to support this? So um, the, uh, the that depends on your file system. No, it doesn't really depend on the file system. Uh, network file systems are a bit special. Um, but I have prototypes. I had a prototype for CephFS, uh, which I think Jeff Layton already saw, um, and uh, it needs a bit. Uh, it needs a bit more work. But in principle, it's really easy. Like all of the inoth methods already pass down uh, the relevant ID mapping or the user namespace that is attached to the mount, and then it just needs needs to switch to the generic helpers uh, that we have in include uh, Linux mount ID mapping. And we also, I have written like a 900 uh, word, 900 word, 900 a long document describing how ID mappings work. Um, and as long, for example, as the file system uses uh, inode uh, init owner, then everything is already there. Um, and it's really, essentially, uh, the, if you look at the patches for X4 or XFS, they were fairly minimal. The only time it needs a bit, bit of thinking is when your file system does anything directly with UIDs and GIDs, which not a lot of file systems do. Um, XFS did it, for example, in a few um, quota allocation paths. Um, but other than that, it should be fairly simple. And I'm obviously uh, always willing uh, to help out with this if people have a use case for this and think this is, this is something that they want to support. I mean, definitely in NFS and SMB, I mean, these come up all the time, right? Is that people are running containers all, all the time over NFS or SMB. I and, think uh, K is, yeah, K yeah, is. So what, I'm, what I'm thinking at a very high level is that, that for whether you're talking about AFS or whether you're talking about any of these, most of these don't use UIDs. The ownership is expressed yeah. as a globally unique number. So this, in their inode, they have a globally unique number. And what's needed is a way to translate that globally unique number mm. to a specific UID that's different for each container. So for network file system, things get a bit, uh, dis I looked at, even before this was merged, I looked at networking file systems because I was like, oh, this is probably going to be complicated because what, what if I have CIFS 
which doesn't really, what role do UIDs and GIDs play in CIFS when it interacts with the server and so on? And uh, network file system in this sense can be a bit tricky. For example, what uh, CFFS does, if I remember this correctly, it always sends the FSUID of the, uh, of the caller uh, with any request that it makes to a CFFS uh, server. And uh, this, uh, view, this FSUID is more or less in the server only used uh, um, when you have access restrictions on the server and you, for example, say, if someone sends me this UID uh, and it doesn't match the UID that I set on the server, um, then they are not allowed to interact with any files or create any files on disk. And so when you have an ID map mount uh, and the, the, you create, you go through a client which uses an ID map mount, uh, you always need to make sure that you send the ID mapped uh, FSUID to the server or do you need to at least figure out what you want to send to the, to the server. It's like yeah. things like that that can get complicated. I think for NFS and AFS and SMB, it's much simpler than that because on the wire, they have a globally unique number. There's no issue like this. So the only trick is that when a UID comes in, let's say on create or whatever, when a UID comes in, yeah. they have to map that. Yeah, Chuck, yeah. Um, I, I was wondering, I, do you have to remount if you want to change the mapping without unmounting the file no, system? No, we implemented it in such a way uh, that uh, the ID mapping can't be changed once it is established. You can't do a remount and then do uh, and then attach, for example, another username space because it would have been a horrible. It would have been rather complicated to do this nicely in the in the BFS because then you get into lifetime issues. You need to guarantee that uh, everyone who wants to operate on the ID map mount, uh, that, the, uh, that the relevant object, the struct username space, doesn't go be, uh, away behind your back. And that's all kinds of complicated. So the way this is done right now is you create a new detached mount with OpenTree clone, uh, which is the, uh, uh, I showed this on the slides, I think, uh, which is a new system call in the new mount API, which gets you a detached mount, meaning it's not visible anywhere in the file system. Then you can change the ID mapping and then you attach it to the file system. And uh, if as soon as you change to the uh, ID mapping or you have the mount attached to the file system, you cannot change anything anymore. Okay, a second possibly related question is, how does the scale and the number of mappings uh, per mount? I mean, for example, if you've got uh, yep. a multi-user system with a thousand users yep. on it yep. that you want to map, I have a unique mapping for every one of them. So I did, um, there's uh, two ways to understand this. Either it's a question about the number of mounts or it's a, uh, it's a question about the number of uh, mappings uh, per mount. One mount, one mount. okay. So um, I uh, originally user namespaces only supported uh, up to five individual uh, mappings. Uh, you see, you saw that, oh, come on. You saw that line up here. Um, where it's 65534 uh, colon 1000 colon one. And originally you could only have five. Back in 2015 or in 2016, I don't know, I changed uh, the user namespace to allow up to 340 individual mappings. And that's sort of the limit. The, this has uh, cache line issues, essentially. Um, this is in a hot path. And uh, the way, for example, one of the advantages of attaching a user, a user namespace uh, to the ID map mount, uh, instead of, for example, calling override creds uh, in, uh, in the VFS, is that you don't get any DOS issues. And you can work under RCU nicely and so on. So that's, uh, um, uh, that's rather simple. Um, if you... Yeah, you are in a hot path uh, with, 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 with these, if every time you call, um, for example, uh, FSUID, GID has mapping, which the VFS, for example, does every time a file is supposed to be created. It checks, um, can this UID and GID be represented uh, by the file system? Is there a sensible value assigned to this? So it calls that a lot and a bunch of additional checks. And every time it, it uh, looks into the attached mapping um, of the username space, uh, and checks is this UID and GID um, mapped. And so that's a hot path. And uh, the way this works is if you have up to five mappings, then it's a simple array. And if you have uh, more than five mappings, up to 340 individual mappings, then um, you have a forward and a reverse pointer that point to a, 
an array that sorts either by the first UID, so 65534, or by the second U, starting by the second UID, 1000. And then you can really efficiently, uh, binary search, obviously. Uh, you can use binary search uh, to guarantee uh, that this performs really well. But um, it, the struct is, uh, I optimize the struct such that it's really cache line aligned. And so increasing the number of mappings will be difficult. Yes. So thinking about performance, um, there's, if you look in a user S bin, right, there's what, three or four ID mapper utilities there, right? Different file systems have their own up calls for yeah. ID mapping. And presumably all of those have to be changed to fix this. All of the, all the ones that are in user S bin have to do something to take advantage of this. But right now there's three or four of them. What I'm wondering about is like that, you know, calling up calling up, calling up, NFS ID map, SIFS ID map, RPC ID map, all the different ID map ones that are already in user S bin. Um, is that going to be slow? All these are a better way to make them faster. Look, I think on those mapping between names and numbers. Yeah. So we say between Br Brown and 37 not between 37 on this mountain yes. and 221 on that mountain. That's a different, that's a totally, that, that's the, that's the um, thing. The uh, UID and GID mapping that uh, NFS uses, I'm not an NFX per, uh, expert, so please correct me if I'm wrong. That's, um, that's concerned with mapping UIDs to usernames by calling yeah, out to a server. This is more slightly, this is a separate issue. This is how do we deal with network file system foreign identities on your system. Yeah. Like if, if I have a container and UID 37 is, you know, I don't know, Christian at something or other, and then I go in another container and it's UID 96, I mean, you're doing two NFS ID uh, map calls, right? Yeah. You're seeing user at something and you're looking up his ID map and then you're doing the reverse. So in one container, you're looking to see what the username was and in the other container, then you have to look at the ID for that username that you just queried in the other one. Like you but that's after going through the... Christian's yeah. mapping there, or before we go look at it. So you're talking about the raw ID from uh, the, the medium, effectively. Well, the medium, the raw he's ID He's translating is the, the medium domain, to the right? presentation for the application and back yeah. again. But he's going to represent that ID yeah. differently, but at some level, they have to look up the right. But yeah, but when you, you, the network file system, see it again, you're seeing the raw number, not what's presented to the user. Well, yeah. you're seeing a mappable number in a namespace. There are well, different, there are yeah, different yeah. mappings in different namespaces. Yeah, have but that, that's mapping. a separate part of the problem and yeah. isn't covered by Christian's thing. We need, we need to deal with that too at some point, but that's a lot harder. I believe your ID mapper programs map the KUID, so effectively yeah. it's constant, and then this will do the U, UID mapping on top. But to, uh, to devices, medium, so it may have the same UID, so if you plug in a USB stick with an XTT file system on it, it may have ID 37. You go look at it on AFS, you may see ID 37. Look on NFS, you may see ID 37, but these were different ID 37s. Yes. So, yeah, I, I think this is a slightly different topic, but I think if we've exhausted this one, and I know we're almost out of time. Oh, sorry. Uh, what is there any thinking about wanting to support project IDs? I know some yeah. container systems use project yeah. IDs I for their own use, but if you want to do nested containers, yada, yada. I think we need, uh, we definitely need to, uh, to revisit this issue. I think this is, um, we've basically dodged this issue for years and didn't, uh, didn't uh, really bother with it because nobody could be bothered to have clear semantics. When I looked at the project IDs paths, uh, uh, when I did the original work, I, I was, confused on a lot of levels um, because it's usually, for example, um, uh, you interact with um, the username space that the file system was mounted in, but in all of the, or most of the project ID paths, uh, the init user in S is used. And so it's, it's a very schizophrenic situation where it's not very clear what the intended semantics are. And uh, the, the main problem that I want to tackle going forward in the future is we need to provide better documentation what's going on uh, with uh, UID and GID handling uh, with, with quotas and uh, come up with, uh, with better semantics for a few other things in the, in the VFS layer, but it's definitely on, on my to-do list because people want to do this and we get requests for this all of the time. <laughs>
And so the only question I had is, is Project ID more than XFS now? Because when I last looked, it was only XFS. Uh, EXD4 also supports Project IDs, and I think there was some question that Derek and I were puzzling over whether we did it the same way in the, in the presence of namespaces and how project IDs were mapped in namespaces. The intent is to unify it, but I confess I'm confused what the semantics should be, so. <laughs> as far as I understood, uh, quota can mean a lot of different things for different file systems. Uh, having worked with this uh, parts and user space also a bit, not just in the kernel, uh, it's very difficult, for example, if you set up a container rootfs and you want to say, uh, I want this, the container to only have this and this much quota, then butterfs will require a very different setup than xfs or x4, and it's really hard for user space to actually get this right. Yeah, so and, and I just wanted to point out before we let Amir do his thing, uh, Jan says on the chat that like the VFS quotas, like the normal stuff, seems to be missing the ID map handling. So it looks like it doesn't do the correct conversion for like Q get quota. Yeah. So, but anyway, let's let's uh, move this to hallway track and Amir, you're up.